Yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer and he is in you and you need not be afraid. And now, Hal Lindsey's Bible study, The Book of John. Now, I really believe that if you've made a choice and you have believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have received the gift of pardon that he died to give you. That's the point of salvation. That's the point when instantaneously the Holy Spirit gives you the new birth. He creates God's kind of life in you and puts it in you. He gives you a new spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in that new spiritual life inside of you. That's the new birth. And uh, yet, I believe, after that happens, now, if you were submerged when you were a child, forget it. That means nothing. You were dedicated. You weren't baptized. But after you have made a, uh, the decision and been born again, then I believe you should be baptized. Now, I don't believe your salvation depends on that. But I would be surprised that anyone who has been born from above by the Spirit would not want to follow the Lord's command to be baptized in water. The Apostle Paul said something about baptism in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 17 which I think puts baptism in its proper place. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. This is what he says. Now, I mean this, that each one of you who is saying, I am of Paul, I of, pa I of Apollos, I of Cephas, I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God. Now listen to this carefully. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also maybe the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, if baptism was part of salvation, he could have never said that. Could he? Man, he would be hunting for the nearest creek or bathtub or whatever because he hadn't finished the gospel if, if baptism saved you. But he says, Christ didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel, which gets people born again. But he always urged people to be baptized, as I do. And if I baptize you, don't try to save the front curl in your hair and not go all the way under water. You're going under water, as many have found that I put into the Jordan River. Because what you're doing is giving a testimony to God above all when you're baptized. You're telling God in that divine act, that, that sacrament that he commanded, you're telling God, I believe that the moment I believed in Jesus Christ, I was so put in union with him that I was put to death and buried with him in baptism. And that's when you go into the water. And I was raised with him into new life as you come out of the water. That is what you should be telling God in your heart when you're baptized. You should know that. It's a picture of believing that you're so in union with Christ that everything that happened to him is happening to you. And when you do it that way, baptism really takes on meaning. The greatest baptisms I've ever participated in took place at Berkeley during the free speech days when the communists had their banners out there and all of the various groups had their banners out there and we would have a uh, free speech thing on the steps of Sproul Hall there, and uh, people would come to Christ, and we'd take them to Ludwig's Fountain right in the middle 
of that and baptize them there. And it would drive everybody nuts. I miss the smell of tear gas because we had so it caused such a furor. The police would come, tear gas would be flying and everything. And I'd turn to my buddy, Pat Matricia, and I'd say, isn't this great? <laughs> All right, verse 6, where Jesus goes to really interpret the meaning of anathan, which means from above. He, he goes to emphasize the source. He just said, unless a man is born from above, he cannot enter the kingdom of God and so forth. So now he, he goes to the source. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Here's another way of translating that. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. What this is emphasizing is the source of this, bab or of this birth. Now, this gets to the thing that I believe God put in nature when he created all of us. Like begets like. I believe there are certain barriers between certain kinds that are never passed. God made it that way. This evolution bull, give it back to Satan. There's no evolution. There may be some development within kinds, but one kind doesn't become another kind. And Jesus emphasizes that very concept here when he says that the source of this New birth is the spirit. Flesh can never give birth to anything else but the flesh. And the spirit only gives birth to the spirit. And so he's emphasizing to Nicodemus now, this great theologian, he's emphasizing to him, look, the source of this birth is from above by the Spirit of God himself. And he gives birth to spiritual life that is God's kind of life in you. And Jesus goes on. In verse 7, I always laugh, especially when I read this in the Greek Testament. And I'm going to read it the way it is in the Greek. You should not be surprised at my saying, you all must be born again or from above. See, Jesus was a southerner. <laughs> because in the Greek, at this point, the word you that Jesus addresses to him is plural. So he's not just telling Nicodemus he needed to be born from above. He's saying, you all, a whole bunch of you, need to be born from above. You shouldn't marvel at that. You're all lost with all of your theology. And so he widens the gate here. You should not be surprised at my saying, you all must be born from above. And then in verse 8, he gives some illustrations out of nature. Jesus was the greatest illustrator of any teacher that ever lived. Wonderful illustrations from things that everyone could experience. And you know, I remember struggling all alone on a tugboat, Mississippi River below New Orleans, struggling to find God. And I remember reading this. And God had prepared me for this because only a few weeks before, I had gone through a big hurricane down on the Delta region of the Mississippi below New Orleans. And boy, I'll tell you, when you're down in the Delta region in a hurricane, you know you've been in a hurricane. And I, were, I wrote it out. On the boat. So I saw what wind can do. 
and I was perfectly prepared for Jesus to hit me that night with this illustration. This is what he said. And remember, he was saying this to a great scholar. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do, know, do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, I was sitting there trying, struggling. After I've read the chapter several times, this chapter, and I knew there was this was the answer somehow. And as I struggled through this, and I came to this verse, it hit me on one of the umpteenth times that I went through it, where it said, the wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it. You don't know where it came from, where it's going. And I remember being on deck. I could feel that wind. It was nearly blowing me overboard. And the worst of it was at night. And I was trying to lash some things down on the deck. And I could feel this wind just moving me along. But I couldn't see the wind. I could feel it. And I could sure see what the power of the wind was doing. But I couldn't see the wind. So is everyone who's born from above by the Spirit. You can't see him, but you know he's there. You see his power whipping through you. You know, how in the world he's doing it? Sometimes I don't know where did that come from. You don't know where the wind's coming from, but you sure know it's there. And you see its power moving. But that's all you need to know, isn't it? You know he's there. And you can face anything like a lion when you know he's there. Verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said to him, this, this is the conclusion of a great scholar after hearing these things. He simply said, how can these things be? Jesus just, he did he did the one thing that would make him open. You know that? Jesus always knew the right approach to someone to strip away what would keep him from seeing the truth. And so Jesus was hard on him, but he later came to know him because he was. I'm sure that Nicodemus thought over and over and over again what Jesus told him that night. And he found, he finally came to know him when he helped Joseph of Arimathea take him down from the cross and wrap him in a burial shroud. But Jesus hit him with the one thing that would tear away all of the blindness that his training and teaching had done to him. This is what he says in verse 10. Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher? Thank God in New American Standard to say it. Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? He didn't say, are you a teacher of Israel, did he? No, in the Greek, the definite article is in the position, in the syntax of emphasis. To emphasize Jesus is saying to this man, he is the greatest teacher in Israel. That's the meaning of that definite article in the place of emphasis. He wasn't talking to just a teacher of Israel. He was talking to the best teacher in Israel that day. And he says, you know, he's just said, how can this be? Jesus, Jesus comes back at him and he says, are you the teacher? of my people Israel, and you do not know these things? Well, I can just imagine what Jesus would say to some of the pastors of some of the churches today. Are you the teacher and do not know these things? Verse 11. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak that which we know 
and bear witness of that which we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. We, we, our. To whom is he referring? Absolutely. You know why we know it? Next verse. Now remember, we're talking, Jesus is talking to a scholar who knew the Old Testament by heart. So he refers to something here that would key in why he used we, we, and our. He says, if I told you of earthly things and you do not believe it, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And here it is. And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. And by the way, who is speaking to you? Now this phrase, or actually it's a paragraph that comes out of the Old Testament. It comes from a very important verse in the Old Testament. No one has ascended into heaven but he who descended from heaven. And Jesus names himself as the one that verse spoke. So, what does this verse really say? Well, look at Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. This was a well-known verse, but was mostly ignored. Still is today. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hands? Who has wrapped up the water in his cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. This is an Old Testament verse that clearly says God has a son. And... It refers to him as being the one that holds the earth in the hollow of his hand. The one who created it. And he is the one, it says, who has gone, uh, come up to heaven and come down from heaven. And he claims right here that he is the one of which that verse spoke. No man has gone into heaven but he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man. And here he's emphasizing, you know, a lot of people wonder, why does Jesus call himself the Son of Man all the time? I think I've mentioned this before, because that was the great novelty to him. He had always been God. What was novel to him is that God stepped out of eternity into time and was born through a virgin as a man. And he loved the title being the Son of Man. That was new. That took the greatest sacrifice he ever made to take upon himself forever a human nature and be bound to his divine nature, the Son of Man. And that's what he meant when he says, we speak to you, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. We speak to you of things that we know, things that we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. That was his authority for telling him the things that he did. To think that this purest of all gospel, this incredible passage was spoken to one man originally. He says in verse 14 and 15, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes may in him have eternal life. Now, to you and me, that would not be a strong salvation appeal, would it? But to the man to whom he was speaking, this was boom! This was an atomic bomb. Because it was telling him how simple it is to come to have eternal life. Remember, he knew the Old Testament. Turn with me quickly now to Numbers 21. In verse 5, And the people spoke against God and Moses. 
Why have you brought us up out of the out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we loathe this miserable food. They were talking about manna. They they were tired of manna. And uh, the Lord sent fiery vipers, literally, among the people. And they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the vipers from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent or viper and set it on a standard and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he shall live. Now, Moses took brass and brass is important because in the, in the Old Testament, everything that was used in the construction of the tabernacle and later used in the temple Every, even the metal had special significance. For instance, brass was always associated with judgment. Silver was associated with redemption. Gold was associated with deity, etc. But brass, the brazen altar, the brazen laver, you see, everything had to do with sacrifice for sin. Judgment of sin was made of brass. So Moses took brass and shaped it into the shape of these these uh, aggressive, deadly vipers that were all running through the camp. And he shaped this viper out of it, and he put it on top of a pole, and in the center of the camp, as God told him, he lifted it up and put it up there, and it stood on the top of this pole. Now God says it will come to pass that when a person's bitten, and these vipers had a deadly venom. I mean, once they, they bit you, you didn't have but a few minutes to live. The, the poison was absolutely deadly. And so he says, whenever someone's bitten, as soon as they look at this brazen snake on top of that pole, they'll live. Now, you got to think about how big that camp had to be. My gosh, they had about a million people out there. And in the center of the camp, I mean, suppose you were bitten by a viper and uh, you were out on the edge of the camp. Well, you could barely see that pole. You'd just look and see it at the distance. You couldn't see it well, but you could see where it was. Well, this is what happened. In verse 9 it says, So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. The instant that he looked toward that serpent, in faith in what God had promised, that deadly venom was arrested and taken out of his body, and he lived. What's the serpent a symbol of? The original sin. Bronze. A picture of the original sin and sin being judged. Lifted up on a pole. As Jesus would be lifted up on a cross. But the important thing is it tells us how much faith it takes to be saved, doesn't it? If you were way out on the edge of the camp and you could barely see the pole, that serpent, all you had to do was in faith turn and look in faith toward that stupid bronze serpent. (laughs) And the venom would immediately be removed and you would live. In the same way, the minute you look in your spiritual eye toward Jesus hanging on the cross for you and believe that he died for your sins. The terrible venom of sin that is in us all that will send us to eternal separation from God is taken away 
and instantly you're given eternal life. Have you looked with faith in Jesus dying in your place on the cross and paying for every sin you'll ever commit? If you haven't, look in faith toward him right now and say, I accept your death in my place. In that moment, you'll be born from above. You won't see it, but the Spirit is there. You'll do it. So simple that people stumble over it, isn't it? Faith is something that happens in a moment. But it's simple, and it is the object of the faith that saves you, not how much faith you got. Not how much you can swear I'll be better, because you won't. You're a stinker from birth. God knows it about all of us. But look to Him and receive a birth from above. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. You can find more of How Lindsay at his website, www.howlindsay.com. There you can access our video and article archives. Visit our online store for How Lindsay CDs, books, and other specialty items. Hal Lindsey is pleased to present his first ever audiobook, Faith for Earth's Final Hour, read in its entirety by Joel Weldon, professional voiceover artist. Recognizing the truth of Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. This audiobook is now available for purchase in three formats. A nine CD set for $44.99 plus shipping and handling, a USB flash drive for $44.99 plus shipping and handling, or as an audio download from HalLindsay.com for $24.99. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsay Media Ministries. P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.